Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to episode 53 of the Mind Heist podcast with uh, myself, Amin, and. and uh, um, oh, God, what name should I go with? But, but uh, it starts with M. <laughs> Muhammad, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, Muhammad. when I was at work the yeah. other day, um, flipping, obviously, I beat a bunch of new colleagues, and they were just like, oh, mm. we, should, um, we should give you a nickname. And I was like, oh, no, please don't like they're like, oh, do you want to, do you mind being called Mo? And I was yeah. like, uh, Muhammad's fine. And then they just ended yeah. up calling me Richard for the rest of the shift. Oh, I, no. was, I think there's, Wait, a, there's another this? guy. There's another guy called Mo, but he's not like Muhammad or anything. I th- his name's Richard. The reason mm. they call him Mo is because there's like an acronym M.O.E. And he always forgets to fill out this form with M.O.E. in it. So everyone calls him Mo. Oh. And then they I thought, thought, well, Mo he's called Mo, we'll call you Richard. I was like, please don't. <laughs> Money guys, over man. everything. <laughs> yeah, it could be, couldn't it? <laughs> What's, you know, in The Simpsons, does Mo, right? Oh, yeah. Um, what what name is that? Is that shortened version of some name, or is it an actual full name? It's Morris. Oh, it's is it? Morris. Okay, yeah. got it. The only Morris I, I know is uh, Philip Morris, Evil Company. Oh, God. <laughs> you know Philip Morris? <laughs> I'm going to have to Google him. <laughs> no, no. It, it, well, I guess it was a guy. It's the owner of all these big uh, tobacco companies, like oh, yeah, Marlboro. Yeah, yeah. They they own all of these big ones. Um, uh, yeah, when did they start calling you Richard, bro? Uh, like on the on the first day back, but I, I ended it very quickly. Okay. I stopped so responding. Okay. I stopped responding and they were like, uh, you don't like being called Richard, do you? I was like, no, not particularly. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. How's, uh, how's work since uh, we did that episode a couple episodes ago? Um, uh, it's better. Yeah. It's better. I think um, mainly because of, like I did mention, a lot of it is knowledge, isn't it? The more knowledge you have, the more power you've got. Mm. Um, mm, exactly. That's, I think, a lot of anxiety comes from that mm-hmm. and also you know as we do in mind heist we always try and um try and heist our minds try and change the way we think about things mm-hmm. uh and i tried to do a lot of that to the point where i slowly convinced myself that everything you do is an is a is a worthy experience to teach you something and if anything it's an educational experience into um bringing in things into my life that will no doubt benefit me in other aspects and other areas of my life that I care about a bit more. Definitely. Um, did it help though that <laughs> I sp- obviously I spoke about dealing with people that have died and mm. that last week, bro, I just had a griefy one, like, oh, oh man. And, um, I just wasn't really ready for it. Bro. Mm. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit. It's, uh, it was a gentleman that, Essentially, he lives on, you know those houses that are sort of converted into bottom floor, top floor flats? Okay, yeah. Um, so in, essentially, if you were to go into this person's, open his door, you'd you'd immediately be presented with stairs to mm. go to the top. Yeah. So this guy had, he's about 50, 60 years old. Mm. He basically tripped at the top of his stairs and looks like he just flew down the stairs. Mm. Um and landed on his neck and snapped oh. his neck, oh, and, he, and he was he died like that, mm. um, and he died sort of because he died like that. He was pinned up against the the, the door upside down because there's yeah. not that much room. Yeah, and a friend of his um, obviously hadn't seen him in I don't know a week or so. Uh, mm. Eventually uh, managed to gain entry through like they've got like key safes in, in the UK. Yeah, um, and he obviously found him like that and. I had to mm. go, and the worst part of it is that I, it's a, it's really sad. What like is it's it's interesting and sad to see how people live their lives and how it comes to an end so suddenly. And this individual, which is which really brings in home the way that we need to make du'a that Allah gives us an honourable death. He had, mm-hmm. he'd fallen. He was only wearing boxers mm. and a t-shirt, and he fell. And mm. as he died, his boxes had gone down to his knees so his his mm. his backside was you know exposed and stuff mm. and obviously it's the first thing you're presented with when you open the door yeah and the worst thing is to find out who this person is you have to climb over him to get up to the stairs yeah because it's so narrow and i think that was the hardest thing i've ever done in my life <laughs> 
<laughs> to to climb over yeah essentially a body to get to their dress mm. oh my god cuz someone had to do it and i was there and i was just like how am i going to do this um and yeah i did it i got up there and i was like oh my god that was the most awful thing i think i've ever done and then dealing you know looking looking and the thing is i get caught caught up like looking around the house and stuff mm. and i came across diaries i came across you know mm. this person's life essentially i came across yeah. postcards from his daughters it's weird man reading someone's diary and their, their emotions and their feelings and everything everything they go through is on that piece of paper no this privacy bro no yeah, privacy but... government comes snooping in my diary <laughs> even after well, i'm dead i picked i'm just to see like if he had any medical and he did he had he had spinal surgery he had mm. do you know what i mean he, i think maybe he didn't walk very well and just reading that sort of stuff and this guy he was a he was a laborer and it was really interesting because he mm. he'd write in his diary this is what it's, it's almost like a work diary but then it was like a personal one at the same time so let's say today he would write this is what work i've done this is who owes me money then he yeah. would write the next bit he would write is how he felt like what's going on through his mind how he okay. feels you know what i mean that kind of stuff like personal stuff and then he'd finish it off with what he's cooked today for dinner okay it would be it was it was really weird but interesting at the same time so every day he would do this it was almost like mm. regimented but that because of that it made it a lot harder to sort of deal with because i was really sort of engrossed into this guy's life yeah um and then i would i would forget i would completely forget at some stage that why i'm there you know forgetting that there's essentially a body at the bottom of the stairs because you have to wait for people to come and you know take it away and stuff and i would <laughs> sort of catch a glimpse as i turn and i'm like oh my god and i get freaked out because i forget completely that that's why i'm here do you know what i mean yeah yeah um anyway yeah i know i just i didn't want to go too deep into what we talked about last <laughs> i episode, think you went but, pretty deep bro yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i suppose i've got to talk about it that's, but yeah it's that's just, crazy it's interesting it's interesting bro like, that's crazy man it's like, uh i don't know man i guess there's many good things about it though it's like you get to reflect on everything like you said like how you're gonna die you reflect on death you reflect on I don't know, just, I don't know, for example, what I, what I just started thinking is how I even go, like the way you dress, yeah, the way you dress even in the privacy of your own home, it's like you should do every single thing the way, as if you could die, isn't it? That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, crazy, man, crazy. I, I'm That's sorry awesome. if there's a sound of a truck in the background i've got the window wide open <laughs> very nice uh very nice weather alhamdulillah these days um Echi, i wanted to go on to the questions because we didn't get get around to them last week um oh, if yeah. you can just pull that up there's something yeah. that i wanted to share as well i got an email and it's probably over two months old but um i think i should share it i had a good reason for sharing it um. so so somebody emailed me. She said that she's been following Sira Master since 2016 with her sister. And I just want to share this because it's like um, when you take action, yeah, and he, uh, as little as my little tips or ideas, whatever might help, it's when you take action, it's like it could really change your life. So, yeah. so she said, um, I think it all started with a Ramadan workshop where you made some kind of Ramadan Ibadah tracker. I like the idea so much, I decide to carry it forward every month with bullet journaling or, or habit tracking, which, alhamdulillah, completely transformed my life. Um, we also really like the idea of keeping yourself accountable with reading Quran daily. Um, you also introduced us to the idea of tracking your Islamic studies and creating a program for yourself. Um, since then, bo 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 bo. Anyway, she's just saying thank you, and um, yeah, basically, she's just saying that these little things, these little tips, I suppose, that she heard from me, she implemented it, and she said it changed her life pretty much, and I can yeah. see how, like, you know, just tracking, tracking like a habit here or there, it really can change your life, and just because, you know, she put the effort into writing this pretty long email, I just wanted to share it, because I think she mentioned she listened to the podcast as well, mm. so... Um, thanks because you know like um, obviously we do podcasts every week I've done 
I don't know, I might have done close to 200 videos on Sera Masters and I've written blog posts and all these different things. And literally, bro, I very rarely hear if anybody's even doing what I'm suggesting, uh, even benefiting. Like, you, you don't know. And that's pretty good. But the fact that I get these emails, like, who like maybe once every three months, you know, I get a little message or a little uh, email saying, oh, this changed my life or this changed this. That's good enough. You know, that's it's, it doesn't uh, I don't think it kind of gives your ego too much of a boost because only like once every three months. But it does give you a little sense that, OK, you're kind of on the right track. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Alhamdulillah is very good. And, you know, I appreciate these little little feedback now and then. I think we've got um, we've got quite a few. Let me just have a look at the emails because there was a there was a few. Oh, mm. this went wrong. <coughs> uh, sorry. Assalamu alaikum, brothers Amin and Muhammad. I hope all is well at your end. My name is Hamid and I'm from Singapore, uh, a tiny dot south of Malaysia. Singapore is so interesting, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just, just as it's so. Anyway, uh, I've recently been <laughs> listening to podcasts, and yours has been amazing. I hope Allah allows you both to carry on making more podcasts. I particularly enjoyed the episodes of Brother Amin's Hajj Trip and Modern Hijra, one with Kaya. Mm. I have two questions for you guys. Firstly, how can someone learn to have a location agnostic business, as Brother Kaya mentioned? If you've already discussed about this, direct me to the episode and I'll hear and benefit from it, inshallah. Um, yeah, let's answer that bit first. How does someone go about that, Amin? You are the expert in these in these matters. <laughs> I mean, the the question really is not um, how do you how do you do that because that's obvious, right? You you just think of what businesses don't require me to be in that physical location, of course, right? But mm. the real question is how do you actually start a business that actually works, isn't it? <laughs> because that's the difficult part, and that's the part where you know you need a lot of guidance and help and stuff. And I don't know, bro. I mean, there's flipping. You can answer this question with like 50 different books you know what i mean yeah, so yeah. i don't even know where to start you just need to obviously you need to think of what kind of businesses are out there that you don't don't require you to be on the ground something maybe like consulting online or services that you could deliver online or um selling physical products um Obviously, physical product require a bit more budget, maybe, but you can, you know, you could put your products in fulfillment, um, kind of what they call them, fulfillment centers, where um, you could be in Singapore, but your product is in America and, and it gets delivered and everything automatically from the mm. fulfillment center. Um, uh, yeah, so these are like the main ones, I suppose. Software as well, like software, you can create that. Uh, from Singapore and sell it anywhere in the world. Um, mm. So, you know, there's actually a lot of scope here for different types of businesses. Um, and when I say consulting, I don't just mean business. I mean, you can consult people on homeschooling, on their diet, on their nutrition, on their fitness, or all of these kind of things. Um, so those are types of businesses. And then it just comes down to uh, lo looking at what problems people have, looking at, for solutions, looking, you know, see if you have any kind of inside knowledge on a certain industry, then hone in on that and, and look at the problems people face and then try and solve their problems. Um, and something maybe a lot of people um, don't understand, maybe something counterintuitive is if there is already a business doing something and they're making good money from it, that's actually a sign for you to do it as well. It doesn't mean you should run away from it. It's a good sign that somebody is doing it successfully and making money. Because very often, there's always room for another um, competitor in the market, you know. There's enough room for two, three, four, five competitors, you know, usually. So mm. uh, take it as encouragement rather than discouragement. But of course, don't copy them. Uh, you can obviously, uh, yeah, and you might end up with something similar, but always try and have a unique twist on it and something that you're doing better than others, you know? Yeah. Not at all. Not just to get the, the surface level kind of answer, you know? I suppose it's all about, you just got to pick something and go for it, really. Because I think that's something that always, um, obviously we've had many conversations about this, but that that's what paralyzed me, is just not actually picking anything and not, do you yeah. know what I mean? Just trying to, spending so long deciding what to do that I didn't do anything at all for so mm. long. Mm. Um, I think but, you need to go fast and then slow. So you need yeah. to go fast in starting something that will allow you to get some kind of validation and proof that there's demand and that, you know, demand basically, which usually means 
trying to make, let's say three to five sales of whatever it is, yeah? Try and make three to five sales, do that very quick. Then once you've decided there's demand, then you can go slower in terms of making the product really good and uh, bit by bit improving your marketing kind of process and stuff like that. Yeah. Anyway, second question. Uh, my second question would be about Hajj. Before asking, I'll give you some background. In Singapore, our Muslim population allows the Saudi government to allocate visas for about 800 Hajj pilgrims annually. Ouch. Currently, if I were to, <laughs> currently if I were to register at our national Muslim body, NUIS, the most practical, uh, the most probable date of my Hajj would be 2070. Oh my God! Wow! I'm, 20, <laughs> I'm 26 this year and would really like to perform my Hajj when I'm younger. Do you know of any alternative ways to perform Hajj? If you're in the region, please let me know and we could meet. Oh my God! <laughs> Bro, so this guy would be somewhere between 70 and 80 when he but does. But didn't Hajj. they just open up like? Aren't they like changing all their visas and all this stuff recently? That's yeah, but that doesn't apply to Hajj. Um, Hajj, you, you know, obviously Hajj, you need uh, still need very need to be very careful with the numbers, isn't it? That are allowed to go because yeah. it can get out of hand. Um, I, I don't know, bro. I don't know. I think if you're from Singapore and you only have a Singaporean uh, citizenship, then I think you must leave from Singapore. I think, which means you're probably stuck with that. So. Either just be patient, or maybe the rules will change. I don't know what, or I don't know. It's maybe far fetched. I don't know. You tell me, but maybe you could see if you could get another citizenship. <laughs> sure, there's something, man. There's going to be something out there. Yeah, I'm. It's think... going to be easier to ask around in Singapore. Exactly, yeah, they're the ones who are going to know. Yeah, even yeah, go to like the Hajj agencies or something. Yeah, and and speak. I'm sure you'll find like I'm sure he's got social media and loads of people from Singapore on his me on his social media and stuff. Mm. Put a question out there and see if anyone knows yeah. anyone who's been early. Yeah, and you know, and see what sort of route they took. Because, yeah, and obviously, first and foremost, make the out for it. Um, mm. Because no matter what limit is set there, mm. anything is possible. We mm -hmm. not was, but will you know? And I'm sure there's plenty of people from Singapore that have gone early. Um, yeah, they just know someone who knows someone and. Mm -hmm. It's all about networking, isn't it, really? Yeah. Remember, rules are for strangers, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yes, uh, eventually he said, uh, if you're in the region, please let me know and we can meet up for a coffee or a meal. Why not both, huh? Why not a coffee and a meal? Make my most, make the most of my time in Singapore. While I'm <laughs> uh, right. I would like to visit Singapore, man. Um, I I've definitely would, bro. It looks wild, man. I've been to Malaysia, not Singapore. Uh, just bro, just the airport is mad. Looks mad. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, not I. Definitely. I don't really like the food they got over there, but khair. <laughs> khair, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else we got? Uh, oh, this is from. I don't know if he minds us saying his name, but he always emails us. Uh, Oh, he just said, love the latest episode. Achi Tweet is a real man's man. <laughs> I think he's talking about the last episode that I did, or the one but just before last. Um, what else we got? We've got a lot of enormous ones. Uh, let's go with the oldest. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullah. I just listened to episode 49 discussing Hijra with brother Amin and brother Kaya. I'm a Somali who was born in Christchurch, New Zealand, and raised in Sydney, Australia. I would love to go to... I would love to go to places like the UAE, UAE in the future, inshallah, for Hijrah. First of all, I would like you and everyone else to say, alhamdulillah, that they live near civilization. <laughs> it's, much, <laughs> it's much easier for you guys to go to places like Africa, Europe, the Middle East, etc. and go in and out, go Hajj and Umrah without the hefty plane ticket. Alhamdulillah, not really complaining, but I want you guys to know your ni'mah, alhamdulillah, compared to us in the land down under. Shazakallah khair for your efforts. I really enjoyed, I'm really enjoying and benefiting from the podcast Allah yara, Allah yara hmm. um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just a comment <laughs> oh okay okay yeah although I thought you know like uh, I thought I guess it is kind of far but Australia I thought you could get to Southeast Asia pretty easily from Australia um, but I'm not sure about that but uh, like you know they have uh, Air Asia they have some of these low cost carriers um, I know they go all around Southeast Asia, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, but I don't know if they go as far as Australia. 
But uh, anyway, it's true. He's definitely far from, uh, you know, Hajj and Umrah and stuff. Uh, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, make dua. You know, the, the what's it called? The technology is kind of improving. I, I heard the other day, um, I can't remember which airline, they did a first flight. It was mad, bro. It was something like New York to somewhere in Australia, nonstop. So these kind of nonstop things are becoming available. Mm. Available. Yeah, yeah. Say alhamdulillah, bro. Alhamdulillah, bro. I live in the city, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, see what else. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Akhtu Inamin. I just wanted to say I really love your podcast. I've been listening for a while now, and I honestly think it's benefic- benefited me so much and helped me to become, uh, to be self conscious. And it's nice to hear other practicing Muslims' perspective and like keep it up, guys. These aren't really questions anymore. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. But we got to clear through them so we don't of just course. leave people hanging. Uh, I always reply. Uh, so that I can sort of let them know that that we've, we've been brought. yeah alright next one. Oh god I, re- I remember seeing this question I thought oh god <laughs> what do you guys think about health and fitness and how do you implement it into your busy lives who said um, I have a busy life uh, I, 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 bro we're so busy that we can record a podcast every week yeah and alhamdulillah I how do I implement it into my busy life well I've been to the gym twice in the past two days which is great mm. <laughs> that's about it <laughs> <laughs> i'm so broken man i'm absolutely broken from the gym <laughs> yeah so what are you doing these days in the gym uh doing something i think it's just important to move isn't it mm. do you do like weights though or like yeah mostly like um, uh compound exercise or you go exactly. all the way into the details just compound exercises mm. yeah bro. that's good bro that's like minimum effective dose isn't it <laughs> yeah. um so like uh, uh bench press deadlift and squats something like that yeah and then you know a bunch of other stuff um, do you do bicep curls bro do you know what i don't do it nearly as much as i should because what do you mean should i mean the only reason <laughs> i thought uh, you do bicep curls is uh two reasons one if you're just like obsessed with your looks yeah the other the other re- the real only real reason is for your back strength right because it'll help your well, this is back it. strength a lot of it is i'm trying to i'm not really fussed about appearance i, I know that sounds really sort that's because you already got it that's because i already got it no mm. but <laughs> in all honesty it's more about at this stage of my life it's and especially the work it's more about being functionally yeah. able to do you know what i mean so yeah. when it comes to you know, major muscle group. It's because you know the pushing and pulling. It's stuff mm-hmm. like that. That's all I need, really, is mm-hmm. the pushing and pulling and leg strength to 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 basically everything, really, because you use everything. But yeah, you know, you know, back, chest, arms, and legs, um, mm-hmm. essentially, because these are all core sort of areas where things need to be. And and and, and also, it's not just I don't really want to just bloody lift weights because that's not what's happening. Mm. out there is it you're not being you're not going to get tested on being able to lift a dumbbell you're going to be tested on actually grabbing people or, mm-hmm. or defending yourself or whatever so you want to incorporate as much of that practically into your into your routines as possible yeah. um, but above all it's just about get it's just about moving unless you're you know really into it it's mm-hmm. just about keeping your body moving and you don't want to become stagnant mm-hmm. um, and keep that flexibility and stuff because mm-hmm. i know it's just going to bite me back when i'm older Mm-hmm. You know, inshallah if I live that long yeah definitely man and you gotta that's a good thing with stuff like deadlifts is it it goes for those muscles that are really key you know your core your um what do they call it like your thighs I suppose um your back you know these are like kind of sometimes neglected I think right so yeah. so it's very good when I used to go to the gym I used to just do that bro just bench press deadlift and squat that's it nothing else i thought what is the minimum that would make me feel like okay i'm doing something um and and i wanted to you know my core to be strong and that was it uh i you know i have a very uh, my relationship with the gym is like so on and off because i always go and i'll get into a routine like two three times a week i'll go right i i really don't really like it like it just bores me 
you know. But yeah. um, I kind of force myself listen to a you know podcast some while I'm there. Um, and then what happens is I'll either get ill or I'll get injured. And so then I won't go for another like two, three weeks. And then you have to restart the habit and it's just kind of long. So I've been kind of like that for maybe, I don't know, a year, two years. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, people, listeners of the podcast will know um, I used to go every single week climbing. And that's just something good to move. Um, I suppose it did give me some strength, a bit of cardio, but... Um, yeah, it was good to be honest. But right now, I don't. I'm not doing any exercise. I just, yeah. uh, I, I think I eat pretty well to be honest. You know, I, uh, um, as people would have heard, you know, I, I'm now delaying breakfast until like ten thirty, eleven in the morning. Yeah. Um, when I do have breakfast, I have you know protein heavy. Like so, I just have um, cheese and eggs. I do have bread, but it's um, brown bread and not much mm. of it. And then I have just salad uh, for lunch and then dinner I pretty much I have anything pretty much for dinner but um, because only one meal it's not so bad I suppose and I tend not to really like things that are very bad for me you know like yeah. you know stuff like deep fried chicken what let's say yeah like I like that right but I could only really hack that maybe once a week I can't take a lot of these kind of thing I don't really like it you know yeah. Um, so that's where I am. You know, by the way, since I started this uh, salad and, and delaying breakfast thing, I've lost three kilos and I didn't uh, plan to lose weight. And I didn't really think I could lose weight, right? Because I'm not very big anyway. But uh, there you go, I suppose. <laughs> Do you walk a lot? No, I, pr I oh. don't walk much at all. Uh, I walked a couple of days ago. I just went for a walk. Probably lasted actually like forty five minutes actually, but um, now maybe now that the weather's good, I'll kind of walk more often. Um, it, the thing is, I like moving, I like exercise, so that's not a problem for me. It's just that I don't find too many opportunities to do it. I suppose yes, I could force myself to go gym. I could do a walk every day or every week or whatever. Uh, but what I really like is if I had a people I could play five side football with, or you know these kind of things. Yeah, um, paintball is sick. Like if I could do paintball once twice a week, I'd be on that. And paintball is very he hard on the body, like um, cardio wise, very tiring. Um, carrying the gun, the gun, you know, is a little bit heavy, so it works your back muscles to hold it. So I'm on these things, honestly. But I guess I'm just too much of a loner, and I don't live in Dubai where there's a lot of stuff going on. So you know, yeah, definitely. So you're better than me, bro, in this. Well, you know me, I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think they're obviously asking the wrong people for this sort of advice. But it's <laughs> Maybe, something we yeah. need to sort of pay attention to, no doubt. Yeah. Um, because one thing I'm aware of is that, you know, obviously I've got a boy now, and I'm sure I have. I'm sure I have more kids in the future, inshallah. Um, mm. Go on, and, and being a, I never thought I'd be the father of a boy. Um, you thought be the father happy. of a man. Well, this is it. I don't want him to think. <laughs> don't want him to think that you know I'm lazy or oh, I can't yes. keep up with him or whatever. I want yeah. to be a bit. I want to catch up a little bit. That, the whole yeah. idea with having kids young was so that I'm always going to be a bit more mm. in tune. Um, okay, so you can't flop it now. I can't flop it now. So I've got. I've got to be at least relatively impressive to him. I need mm. to be his hero. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, bro. On that topic. Uh, on that topic, you know, I decided I'm just going to go out and, and say it, bro. Um, because, you know what it is, yeah, I decided uh, we, we should do the episode about this. But then uh, I listened to the new episode of Freshly Grounded. Did you hear that yet? Uh, I saw clips of it. I know what, I know what he put, spoke about, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I thought, yeah, like I was going to do it. And then I saw he did it. And then I was <laughs> like, well, then let me do it for sure. <laughs> so so uh, and i know you love this topic and i know because now i'm saying this you're gonna have you're gonna have, you can go for like 10 episodes just about this topic so yeah, we got good. brand new a lot of material you know and obviously the se the thing is the the same happened when i got married i think i got married and then like two three months later i like i, I said it on the podcast so the same happens with this that alhamdulillah had a baby boy a few months oh, ago Akbar. Alhamdulillah, uh, a few months ago now. So uh, I'm, I'm just opening this can of worms for you to 
uh, play with, bro, because you love this topic. <laughs> uh, mate, finally. Because the listeners won't know, but I've been like dodging it for so long. <laughs> yeah. I have to keep. Oh, every time I speak about my son, I have to sort of. Or speak about kids in general, or yeah. you. Yeah. And being, you know, being an adult man, yeah. I have yeah. to accidentally like i'm trying to uh, the amount of times i accidentally almost mentioned it oh yeah your son or oh yeah you're a dad or whatever <laughs> oh my god it's been such a headache every time we record <laughs> alhamdulillah <laughs> so yeah listeners i mean is also a dad he's, he's he's been a dad for how long now about <laughs> yeah a few months now yeah a few months Mm. And he just didn't trust you guys enough to tell you. <laughs> you know, the thing is, bro, yeah, I know I'm a bit paro, yeah, I know that for sure. I think part of that is um, just just the way I am. I don't know, some people just, they, they lean a certain way. But also just uh, some circumstances, some stuff that I, I know of, and I've, I've kind of always heard about these things uh, growing up, kind of shaped, I suppose, the way I, I am, right? But uh, it's also because knowledge really is power. And especially, you know, in the... In the time of like data, big data, this and that, it's like, I feel like every time you put information out there, it's not the same as telling a guy, like I met, uh, you know, I met one of the Mind Heist listeners when I was in the UK, um, you know, randomly, yeah, he, he came up to me. I told him no problem that, oh, I'm going to have a baby soon, this and that, right? But But when you put it out to the public, right, it's like you don't know who's listening. You don't know those people, how they can use it against you. You know, there's identity yeah. theft, there's this, there's that. So that's why I'm quite careful about putting stuff out there because I just feel like it's, it could be used against you. You don't know who's listening. And you, these people that are listening, obviously 99 point whatever percent are harmless, right? But just one, it only takes one person to gather all this information about you, put it together and somehow use it against you, you know? So I don't know if I'm over the top with this, but that's just how I am, man. This is it. And there's nothing wrong with being cautious, man. I mean, as, as, as harsh as it sounds, no one, no one online really deserves anything. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, they don't, they don't deserve to know anything about you. Yeah, they're not uh, entitled to it, yeah. They're not entitled in that sense. So, yeah, you yeah. know, and I think that's the problem. I think we get caught up online mm. thinking that, especially, I think it's even more if you belong to a particular community, um, especially Muslim community, I think I think uh, we are, at least myself, I am more inclined to trust Muslims online than I am anyone else. And because mm -hmm. of that, I think I let my guard down maybe yes. a bit more than I should. Um, and I think that's the problem because there are a lot of Muslims or people that post to be Muslim or whatever that are quite sinister at times. Um, mm -hmm. not, maybe not always because they want to be. I think they just don't know the etiquettes of social media. They don't know the etiquettes of how to hold themselves online. Mm. Um, or they feel, like you said, entitled. Um, and I think it's a bit of a cancer, really, this sense of entitlement online. Uh, mm. It's like people deserve, they feel like they deserve to know certain things or they feel mm. like, you know, you owe it yeah. to them. Um, but anyway, congratulations, bro. Ended up calling him the same name as my son. So <laughs> we, we clearly, clearly this relationship of ours has blossomed to a level that is uh, <laughs> unlike no other. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> yeah, so I thought, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you, you halas now, I'm, I've opened the topic, so go ahead, bro. So how's it been, bro? How has it been? How's it been? Alhamdulillah, bro, it's a blessing. And you know, this is one of the main areas, I think I told you in private, that one of the main areas I feel had just had a good effect on, on me and like my du'as have been accepted is that you know the birth situation all these things i feel it was made easy i feel like it could have been you can always find things that could be harder right you always think okay i've got this terrible job but i could have that terrible job right even more terrible yeah. job so i i just feel like you know there are so many ways that birth and pregnancy and uh, all these things could go wrong and the fact that they didn't i mean i feel like that's you know dua is not just allah giving you stuff it's allah protecting you from stuff as well so Definitely. alhamdulillah i think uh i think it's been good i think you know i don't know bro i am i just boring because every time this something like this happens like i got married had a baby it's like it's exactly what i expected <laughs> it's not i'm not surprised when these you know when these events happen so you know i think as well that 
it's for me at least it's very different for me versus my wife like i think for me my life like my outlook on life might have changed but my day-to-day -day life i can't say it's changed too much uh, I think uh, the first month or so, it was different to now. The first month, you know, you're kind of being a bit more careful um, and stuff like that, losing more sleep and stuff like that. But right now it's like, okay, I'm just kind of, I don't know. I'm just thinking, I'm planning for when he's a bit older, right? I'm, I've got that in my mind more now. I'm yeah. kind of trying to prepare myself, trying to educate myself trying to make sure that by the time he's more conscious, you know, by the time he's one, two, three years old, I'm somebody and he worthy of looking up to kind of thing, which I yeah, guess exactly. I, I'm, I'm trying to do that anyway, I think. But um, other than that, I can't say, you know, obviously everyone always talks about negative stuff when, when you have a baby, but I'm not saying that. Like, I don't find that. I know that's because my wife has taken a lot of the hit. <laughs> okay, I know that I'm yeah. saying that. But as for me, it's like my main kind of work, my main contribution is is my the work that I do. And so I'm doing that. Uh, I am sometimes interrupting the my usual stuff to help out here and there. But um overall it's it's been good, alhamdulillah. It's it's one of the things is it's it's like a big it's like I feel like it's a sign from Allah, like just the fact that just the miracle in a way of how babies can just be born and they know certain things they know how to breathe they know how to how to eat they know you know how to use the bathroom they you know um i find that quite fascinating that's one thing that definitely fascinated me when the baby was first born and stuff is these i just i don't know man i was just very grateful and yeah i just uh i don't know i just wanted to say subhanallah in the in the true meaning of subhanallah you know alhamdulillah brother good man and, and it's a big change and it's just constantly changing there'll be new challenges every time yeah i feel like the main contribution i'm going to be making is it later it, it, like when he's two three four years old that's when i can see that i'll be working on something at home and he's going to come to me and i'll know deep down that okay you've done your work for the day this what you're doing now is extra and therefore now you need to give him the attention give him the time you know so i know that will be coming um but right now like you know he's a baby so and in terms of uh, your involvement in ra in not raising him in like changing nappies and all that stuff, are you much of a, a team player? A <laughs> team player? Well, uh, probably. I don't know what the standard is. I don't know what the norm or the average is. But uh, I don't get too involved in that stuff. I just I just help out when I I see my wife needs help. Um, I'm I'm not like above doing these things, right? Uh, I don't see it like that. It's just that I've got my focus, which is my work. And then when I finish my work, it's like, okay, yeah, wherever I can put him to sleep or uh, take him aside so my wife can do stuff, then I do that, yes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know what the standard is these days, bro. What is the standard? I guess I it depends know, on the culture and the place and stuff, isn't it? But basically, bro, I think I'm just, uh, what most people do is they just imitate their, their parents. And, you know, yeah, exactly. uh, my mum was... But then again, I don't remember, yeah. like, how involved my dad was in this. Yeah, yeah, you don't. But, I mean, this is what I think this is the, the good, the positive side of, of having a culture, you could say, that you adhere to or having traditions you adhere to is you know what is normal, you know what's expected of you, and you kind of just get on with it, right? Um, you, you know the traditions and you get on with it. So um, among my family... Um, it's just it's extremely clear you know the men go and work and the women take care of the kids and simple as that some men maybe they'll be like no I'm not touching the baby like in terms of changing nappies this and that I'm not doing none of that some might say that I'm not saying that I feel like I'm not above it I'll help I can see how hard it is for the mother you know so y you almost can't just leave her to do it all because you see how um you know, how, how the huge effect it has on her life. Like, that is her life now. As for my work, I just, I kind of switch off at 5, 6 p.m. and stuff, you know? This is it, isn't it? I mean, everyone's got their roles, I suppose. Um, yeah. It can be quite... Like, at the moment, we're trying to potty train mm. my son, and it's just... It's good. He's making progress. Mm. But, bro, is it messy? <laughs> yeah. You see, this is where I see... I could see myself getting much more involved in these kind of things more like training more like 
I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I feel like I actually have more to offer because, you know, like a baby just needs a baby. I feel like it's simple in a way, right? It's difficult. Yeah. It's, it's challenging, but it's simple. The baby needs um, uh, to be changed when he's dirty. He needs to be fed when he's hungry and he needs to sometimes be put to sleep. He can't sleep himself. That's it. So um, and it's, a lot of it is to do with feeding. Like sometimes he, he he's hungry or sometimes he uh, he can't sleep or he doesn't want to sleep because he's hungry. So a lot of it, that that's where I just can't do anything. I put my hands up like I can't feed you. <laughs> you know, I can't do it. So, yeah. Mm. Now, this is why I think, honestly, bro, we talk about like gender roles and we talk about um, fitra and we talk about, you know, being close to the fitra and being willing to go out in nature and, and whatever and slaughter your animals and it, this is one of the clear signs that Allah has created us to have different roles in life. Not just men and women, but if you're rich, you have a certain role that Allah has given you in the community. If you're poor, you have another role. And everybody's got different roles. And the fact that the mother is the only one that can feed, or the women at least, because you know it, it used to be much more common that women would share the feeding kind of duties. Yeah, um, yeah. The fact that a woman can, can feed, only the woman can feed, is, is a sign from Allah, I think, that, you know, this is your job. That just how a man, the, si the fact that a man is physically stronger than a woman shows, Yanni, you're the one. you got to go lift this. you got to do, do this physical yeah. exertion. You've got to be the one physically protecting and defending not just your family, but the whole community. So, you know what I mean? These are the signs of the, this is like the fitra, and this is the design of Allah. Well, this is it. I, I suppose. Um, I suppose the, the difficulty is that one would argue a woman's job never stops <laughs> when it comes. Oh to no, definitely. Food. Yeah, definitely. And I think this is something I've obviously tried to balance myself because I could work seven days a week, but then I'll still have the you know whatever those hours I'm not at work to 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 uh, claim that oh yeah I'm off work now so leave me alone sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, my wife always says, well, when do I get a time off? And I'm like, yeah, mm. I guess you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, it's actually, that's why I think the conversation of, oh, men do more, women do more, a women's life is harder. Man, I think it's fruitless, you know, because it's these things are not quantifiable, you know. Like, you can always argue it either way, and I just feel it ends up being very subjective. And I think it's kind of the wrong way to look at the world, like uh, men versus women. You know, I, I, I just think, you could do the same with anyone right so it's like the same discussion kind of happens with the rich and the poor like yeah. oh that guy's making hundreds of millions and he doesn't want to pay tax or he only pays this much tax he should be paying 70 percent tax you know uh, so the poor will say that and then the rich guy will say oh these guys are poor because they don't work you know and it's like it's all subjective you know because you could say the rich guy is rich because he worked so 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 hard um uh, but then you could say the the but then the poor people say oh no we we're, we're trying to work hard but we don't have opportunity it's like you can't quantify it so you can't really compare um so i just think i think yes a woman's job is kind of non-stop like that and she's built to do it of course but and that's where a man just has to have that compassion have that proactivity have that um i don't know just put in the work to help her where you could see you can help and you can make a contribution bro simple uh, I, it, isn't this just simple isn't this just common knowledge that you know if you see your wife who you know you're, you're you're caring for your wife you should be concerned and you should have you know concern for your wife and you want the best for her when you see she's struggling and you you thinking damn like she she doesn't switch off or whatever isn't it just common knowledge that if you find yourself with free time you would help out you know well, this is it, bro. I mean, uh, not everyone has the common sense that you've got, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, this is where I feel like, not not maybe so much recent times, right? But maybe a hundred years ago and before that, I feel like as long as men had free time, it wouldn't even be something that they think twice about, you know? But I don't know. Maybe I need to look into that. But... Uh, Especially when you look at the Prophet ﷺ and how he's just a caring person. You know, you couldn't imagine him kind of just seeing someone struggling and then not helping them. 
right? And I'm not even talking from the point of view of a husband or a father. I'm just in general. If he's outside and he sees someone struggling, you know, he would help them. So what about your wife then? You know? SubhanAllah. I suppose everyone's got different relationships, I suppose, and different expectations as well. I mean, you know, you see some some guys are just completely like hands off when it comes to stuff like this um, mm. and then you've got some some examples of old school generations of fathers that are even more hands off um, mm. it's it'd be interesting to see if that's what women expect when mm. they, but what I'm, I'm, I'm like trying that. to say bro that the even more old school that you're talking about I don't believe they'd be that hands off I mean maybe compared to today's feminism equality standards they'll be hands off but uh, compared to um, a man today in more, let's say, outside of the West, yeah, compared to yeah. them, I feel like the real old, old school would maybe be more contributing. Allah alam. I feel yeah. like it's kind of gone that way where it's like there's the old way, the normal way, if you like. And I say normal because it's been that way for thousands of years rather than just 10, 20, 30 years, yeah. There's yeah. the normal way, yeah. But then kind of since between colonization and today, I feel like it's gone a bit weird, right? And so let's say men used to help around, let's say help with the kids, maybe, uh, you know, 500 years ago, maybe let's say they used to help uh, 10, like just put a number on it, 10. I feel like today in, in certain countries, it's, it's now like a five, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so it's definitely. like it's it's the contribution or the helping maybe has gone down maybe Allah alam and it's complicated right maybe that's because they feel their role is less important and so therefore uh, or they they're losing a role or something like that and therefore they are trying to make up for that by saying no nah, I'm not doing that stuff right so it could be that it could be uh, because of the because of the whole feminist discourse tr maybe pushing men to contribute like almost as much as women they rebelling against that like there's so many variables isn't there but mm -hmm. i think you've got to you've got to this is what i advocate for knowing your role whether you're a man or woman know your role and then don't be so rigid that when you see someone struggling you wouldn't help you know what i mean um but yeah i mean i guess i'm very comfortable with my role like i've got to bring the bread and that means that sometimes there will be pressure on me that I'm not bringing enough bread. Um, but I I can't see myself in that situation um, asking my wife to help. But maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, anyway, I'm just saying that I'm like that. So I know my role very well. I try and do well in that. And I will help in other areas, but I know my role. And I just feel like let let everyone be like that. Like maybe the problem is people are not so comfortable in their role or maybe when they know their role, they're too rigid. So they won't leave their role even just for one day to help in something which is not, you know, normally their role, if you know what I mean. Definitely, man. Definitely. Maybe a lot of people don't know what they get themselves into and then they sort of yeah reluctant to um yeah to basically go all in. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And that's, yeah, like you said, I wanted to actually cover that. Uh, the mention you made of expectations you know um that that's quite a big a big thing i think when you're getting married is what's the expectations when when you have kids because you know you end up you know without you know i'm avoiding obviously i've made my stance clear but i'm not uh, judging people in when i'm saying this yeah is that you could end up a situation where you both feel oppressed right so the the woman expects the 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 mother expects the father to help a lot more so she feels oppressed and then the father expects not to have any uh wife telling him oh can you help me so now yeah. he feels oppressed that she's kind of you know nagging him about about helping out so now they both feel oppressed that's not good is it um you you really want a situation where it's like everyone's comfortable and it's like like life's not easy right so just because you have hardship in life it doesn't mean uh, you need to find someone to blame, you know, like, let's say you're at work, work is very difficult. You know, do you need to blame your wife that I don't know, she's not helping you at work? Like, no, that's just your role in life. That's your job. You're, you, you know, it's, life's not easy, isn't it? Like, I don't know. But 
expectation very important that's why you know i like i think that's why in the past one of the reasons that marriages stayed stayed uh, people stayed together basically and maybe they had more fruitful marriages and family relationships is because there was a monoculture and people when they're marrying they don't even need to discuss these expectations because everybody has the exact same expectations you know um but now it's like well when i say now i mean i'm talking about the west but there's still very you know the same expectations in certain countries um but if we talk about the uk for example where you are it's like you need to be quite clear on these expectations otherwise you might be in a situation where you both feel oppressed isn't it mm, definitely man definitely um and it goes back to what we were saying on previous episodes regarding you know what is one of the reasons you get married in the first place if if it's all you know glitz glam and romance then clearly you're going to be a bit shell-shocked when you've got to deal with kids mm. um, but if you were setting out to get married for and this being one of your main reasons in the first place then it's a mm. it's a sort of different kettle of fish isn't it yeah yeah definitely it's like yeah it's like if it was a side <clears throat> a side goal a side objective not very important to you i can't see how you would take it easily really how would you take it lightly you might see it as a burden i mean it's true like i know i was saying it's amazing how babies are born and they know how to breathe and they know how to feed but there's a lot of things they don't know how to do and that's yeah. why you know you know when babies when they scream so loud yeah i'm talking about like one month two month old baby yeah when they scream so loud you, you get annoyed right you're like what the hell like come on like what do you want from me yeah but yeah. i was you know when my son was doing that i'm thinking the reason he's screaming so loud and he's you could tell like you could kind of hear the anxiety in his voice yeah yeah the reason that is is because he's not thinking this but subconsciously it's like if i don't feed i will die because i can't feed myself yeah. so therefore i need to make it absolutely clear that i need to be fed right now you yeah. know There's, it's feeding's like a life or death thing for this baby because it can't feed by itself yeah, so true. There's a lot of points to ponder, Allah, isn't it, when you have a baby? And a lot of it is involuntary, and a lot of it is just automatic. Like, my son's screaming right now. I can hear him from up here. <laughs> Allahu uh, Akbar. But it could be anything, bro. Uh, mm. I think it gets yeah. more complicated when they get older, isn't it? Like, yeah, his, you, know, and he, you know, he does communicate and stuff. But, like, it, there'll be times, like, he, you know, if he's sleepy or... It would just be so irritable, and you know, like we get irritable when we're just look, yeah, asleep. It would just be like that, where little things would just really upset him, like yeah, like just getting near him when he's upset or yeah. when he's grumpy. It's just like no, get away from me. He was just scream his head off. Yeah, um, and it, and I think a lot of it is to do with this sort of worldview thing. Like we see the world as a, a huge thing. Like we can see different aspects of stuff. Whilst kids that age their world view is very, very, very minimal. It's what's immediately in front of them. Yes. Um, so if if there's something wrong immediately in front of them, then everything is wrong in their mm, life. Yeah, you yeah. Know what I mean? Interesting. Whilst for yeah, us, you know, if one thing goes wrong, if we, you know, spill something, then mm. that's just, we've spilled one thing. It's not yeah. like everything else is wrong. But for yeah, kid, it's like, at least I've got, everything. yeah, at least I've got family, got a job, got this, got health, got, <laughs> like kids don't, can't see that. I mean, I read that, kids don't even know they really exist until they're around two years old. Like yeah, they don't have yeah, yeah, yeah. A awareness of their existence. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of them like identify so strongly with the mother that they can't see a difference between themselves and their mum. Mm. And then mm. later on they, they will sort of separate. That's why they're so mm. fascinated with their own reflection because they haven't got a clue what they're looking at. <laughs> mm, yeah. You know, one thing I've kind of felt when the, since the baby's born is, as soon so the younger a baby is or the younger your child is i feel like the more anything can influence them right uh, because it compounds you know so if you if you traumatize a one-year-old they're gonna c carry that trauma for whatever 60 70 years and uh, because they were traumatized such a young age it will affect them when they're three years old you know, it will affect them when they go to school at five or whatever. It, so that will start affecting their relationships, their friendships, maybe. Um, it will affect them then when they go to secondary school, they'll start getting older. Again, the dynamics, the social dynamics, it affects them. Getting a job, it affects them. Getting married, it affects So the younger 
anything happens, good or bad, the stronger the influence will be. Mm. And maybe that's not a good way to think about it because it's put so much pressure on me when the baby's so young. I'm like, <laughs> like you can't mess this up. Like, okay, maybe after he's six or seven, you can mess stuff up. But before that, <laughs> it's like you can't mess it up because it's going to have such a big impact, you know? So, um, yeah, so I've just got that in mind when... You know, when I'm finished with work and I'm just, I just try and, I don't even just looking at him and, and letting him see that I'm looking at him, uh, try and give him attention. Like, I don't know, like I haven't read into this, but I just feel like maybe that will uh, help him in terms of his, who knows, like his confidence. Just the fact that, yeah, my dad is giving me attention. And yeah, so I'm just trying to do all these little things, you know, when it comes to what we feed him, when it comes to... um everything bro just thinking of his immune system okay trying to get his immune system going um you know the way he sleeps um all all these things like trying to get it right at least really try and get things you know off to a really good start you know it's a lot of pressure yeah i suppose is this something like i suppose having kids is something you've is it something you've thought about um like critically thought about for a long time like planning how you're going to be a father what sort of things you're going to sort of you um, know how you're going to practically implement what you want to implement you know what i mean Is yeah yeah you've thought about for a while hmm. i think i have i think i have not in the sense where okay bullet points of what i'm gonna do with my kids but kind of like learning from the mistakes of parents i see learning trying to kind of just be observant of okay that kid's parents are like that and he turned out like this and the cause seems to be that so let me not do that you know yeah. trying to be quite observant of these kind of trends um and then of course you know there was a time more than now when i was reading you know psychology books i was reading about behavior change and i read a book or two on nlp I was a teacher. I mean, teacher teaching is kind of, you know, it's kind of inf trying to influence kids' behavior and you got to be kind of clever with the way you talk to them and everything. So I've been preparing myself perhaps for this um, indirectly for, for years. And then just, I'm kind of into parenting. Like I'm kind of, you know, like I said, I try and observe what, what works with parenting, uh, the effects of like the book I was talking about was it last episode or one before the coddling of the American mind like that book is not about parenting but I'm learning about parenting from it I'm learning the negative effects of you know over parenting uh, and really trying to control and remove all danger from your child's life so every time I read something like that of course I'm thinking about kids because there's no doubt in my mind I've always been thinking about having kids like uh, what I mean by that is there was never a day when I thought huh do I want kids <laughs> like that was always obviously just automatic that of course I'm gonna have kids yeah. inshallah well bro it's gonna be an incredible adventure regardless the same thing I said to Faisal when he told me mm. <laughs> I was just saying like it's just wild and so many people I know now having children for the first time or mm -hmm. second time or third time it's yeah. just all I suppose everyone's at that age now yeah um, it's going to be an interesting uh, generation to sort of see there are some people that are um, plugged in Muslim shall I say that have had kids for a while yeah and, and seeing how they navigate is, is quite crazy I mean for me like grew up not really that connected and then slowly <clears throat> sorry slowly then the world got way more and more connected these kids are sort of growing into that right now. I mean, my son is, um, although I don't really, um, I don't give him iPads or anything at home. He does go to nursery and he uses it there. And they sent mm. me a video of him at nursery using it. And he's just yeah. like, it's second nature, bro. The, second, mm. the way he's operating that iPad is just absolutely second nature. <laughs> it's mm. just insane because. How, you know, how did you, like how did you approach these topics? Like, um, okay, like what you feed him. So let's say what you feed him in terms of when he was uh, when he was a baby, you know, like in terms of bottled milk and these kind of formulas and these kind of things, um, screens, like looking at screens, these kind of things. Like how did you approach that? How, what, how do you think about it? I think a lot of it is just don't really, because it's, 
in all honesty, I don't know about my wife. I think she's done way more research than me. But I just, I'm a very cross that bridge when we get to it kind of guy. Um, mm mm-hmm. I don't think about all these things until I'm faced with them. And mm. the reason being is that otherwise I always feel like I'll stress myself out way too much if I start thinking of everything for first. Yeah. So um, for myself, you know, if, if I'm then faced with a subject, then I'll sort of weigh up the pros and cons there and then. Okay. Uh, nine times out of ten, I just tend to just go down the, oh, what did my family do? Okay, we'll just go with that kind of thing. Right, okay. <laughs> As opposed to... Uh, trying something new because I just don't know what works you know mm. um, as far as like what he eats now like or you know as he was growing up the moment he could have solid food he just although I did sort of get you know those meals you get meals that you can buy in the shops and stuff it just started just giving him what I ate mm. you know what we ate because I just thought well my dad always forced me to have my vegetables and everything like eat more his his theory was that well if he grows up eating what we eat then he'll end up liking it and then he'll be used to that sort of diet as opposed to yeah. eating something completely yeah you know, how would he transition yeah yeah exactly so that was it and he's been fine and i think uh kids are a lot more resilient than we think they're going to be mm. there's always that risk of like oh you know he's, he's going to be too hot or too cold or this isn't going to sit well with yeah, him or whatever. Yeah. well i think I think we underestimate how strong kids are and how much they can put up with. Obviously, we're not, flip, we're not flipping, you know, hurting them or po- poisoning them or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But you'd be surprised. You know, even something like that might be a little bit spicy. Well, yeah, he can try it so that he won't. He'll know what that is. He'll know what spicy is. Otherwise, he'll just freak out. Like I remember when he first tried something spicy, and he was just freaking out because he didn't realize what was mm, going on. Yeah. But now he knows. Do you know what I mean? And we got to be. Yeah. I think the issue is we shelter kids too much. We worry about them hurting themselves yeah. or eating something dirty or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then they just end up becoming really bubbled because the world doesn't really perform like that. It doesn't serve yeah. itself like that to mm. people. Um, what, what I'm thinking is if I raise my kid, quote unquote, normally, yeah, yeah. which is what I consider normal, yeah, he is just going to be so solid, bro. He's going to be so tough compared to all these bubble wrapped kids he's gonna take over the game so <laughs> it's like uh, <laughs> exactly it, it's it's a joke but it's also serious that think about it yeah if a, you we know for a fact you know probably hundreds of millions of kids are being raised in bubble wrap yeah so yeah. if you can raise your kids not like that they will have an advantage in everything in jobs yeah. in business in education in all, ev- they're going to have an advantage they'll just be more resilient they'll be tougher you know mm. so it's the, you're giving them a big advantage and inshallah they're going to do good with that inshallah they'll benefit the ummah with that exactly i think one of the biggest things in terms of um oh, what was that noise uh, one of the biggest things of emotional sort of development for for kids is just this idea of empowerment and it's just knowing the best way to speak to them and how yeah. to treat them. Yeah. Because I don't know what that noise is. It sounds like a helicopter, bro. <laughs> London, man. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, like, so one thing is like labeling theory, which I'm quite strong about, is don't like, if he does something bad, mm. um, for no fault of their own, and I used to do the same thing, is, is saying, oh, naughty boy. Yeah. Right, Connor, why would you do that naughty boy and then yeah. that's immediately that's a label okay I'm a naughty mm. boy mm. that's who I am and mm. then that's who he becomes yeah. um, so what if whilst... you call him Hamar? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god and do you know what it's funny you say that because that isn't entirely um, foreign to, to, to of course from where we come from is it um, <laughs> but will he you... turn into one <laughs> <laughs> this is it yeah. and it's incredible like how because I, if I'd look at my own life and how I focus so much on, like the validation of my father, mm. right, um, and that, that why did that why did that mean so much to me? Why was mm. I chasing that all my life? Mm. Um, not until I self reflected on it deeply at more recent ages in my life that I realised, okay, this has been such a driving factor in everything I do. Um, but yeah, for him, you know, you don't want you want to be able to empower them to give them the confidence that they can make decisions and they can do what they want well mm-hmm. um, and they've got the ability to perform as opposed to walling them off from certain things just through our treatment because mm-hmm. that's what it essentially mm-hmm. does like you know if if, if they fall or hurt themselves oh I'm always going to be there to support them um, 
yeah. if they do something bad, oh, you're you're naughty. If they do something mm. good, okay, maybe praising them way too much if they do something good, right? Oh, if I do yeah. something good, then I immediately get a reward, right? Yeah. So I, that's my expectation. I only do good for rewards, like immediate gratification. Um, mm. And then another thing is teaching them patience. Like sometimes the easiest way to, to stop them from crying is by giving them what they want, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, but it's such an important like these these are and these are the, the core things at least from my point of view as as a father I can't do everything like I I have to hand, hand it to my wife she does the majority of the raising because I'm just not at home um, but as far as my my goals are it's to really try and teach him a healthy mindset because I think that's the one thing that fathers can really hone in on if their communication is key. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of the story of Yusuf alayhi salam and how he spoke to his father and he came to his father with the dream and his father gave him advice. And that advice that he gave him was was mindset management, really. Don't share your dream with your siblings because of X, Y, Z. Mm. Do you understand? Like mm. giving him reasoning and giving him a bit of wisdom and things to think about and, a, and, a, and an approach and a way to carry himself. Um and that that advice goes on for everything, like teaching your child not to to show off or not to share something that might be, uh, what's the word? Might be sensitive or have a backlash on you. And mm. these are all going to be things that we're going to have to teach them, bro. Like the mm. biggest thing I think we as fathers can teach our sons, especially, is how to carry themselves as a man. Mm. How to you know certain traditional ways of holding themselves, certain uh, levels of respect. Mm-hmm. Um, these things aren't going to be taught. Mm. Um, well, that means we yeah. have to lead by example. Of course, bro. And I think... Oh, is that the air then, bro? Yeah, yeah. In that case, bro. Oh, it has been an hour and you did want to catch catch us. No, no, I, I've, got, I've got 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, inshallah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, to sort of wind things down, this is something we can really go in on next episode um, quite, quite deeply, inshallah. Mm. Because... Uh, I'm sure the listeners are going to flood your your emails with with congratulations and surprise <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, um, one thing I've been thinking about is, you know, me. If I think about myself, you know, and this is the whole thing of having feeling so much pressure to like raise your kids so well and all of this. Yeah, um, I was. If I think about myself, I was kind of a a bit of a loser. Like compared to what I I think is good now or how I would expect a good 15-year-old boy to be or man, whatever you want to say, yeah. I was was very far from that, yeah. Uh, But yeah, you know, I went on to to study, to work, to have a family. Like, you know, it's not the end of the world, the fact that I was like that then. You know what I mean? So on one hand, it's like there's a lot of pressure. I'm putting a lot of pressure on myself to, you know, parent the right way and be a good parent but on the other hand i'm like look i'm just gonna try right in the end it's in the hands of allah if if you know my son is guided he's not guided and um you know and then you know (laughs) probably billions if not just hundreds of millions of parents freestyled the whole thing and the kids ended up kind of okay so it's kind of a two extremes you know of like everything must be done perfectly versus well you know we'll see how it goes (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and, you know, bottom line is uh, your first child is always a bit of an experiment, isn't it? Because you just mm. don't really know what you're doing yourself. Well, yeah, um, yeah. You can try and prepare as best as you can. Yeah. But but yeah, what I'm yeah. doing, bro, is what I realized is, you know, for example, I uh, you could say I, I'm a marketer by profession, yeah? That's my kind of skill set. Um, but how did I get to where I am now, where I'm pretty confident I know what I'm doing with marketing and stuff? It's literally four or five years of learning, you know, and the gap between when I started learning and when I actually felt I could do marketing is probably two years, the gap. Yeah. Yeah. And so if I'm going to be a good parent, I need to start now. That's what I'm thinking. So that's why I've been I'm reading a book right now, which is how the Prophet dealt with children. Mm. And I'm also listening to a book. Um. I think it's called positive discipline and the reason i'm doing this like my kind of philosophy when you know approaching any topic is read a lot learn a lot from different perspectives and for example there is there is different schools of thought for example with when it comes to discipline there is 
you know, for example, punish them when they do something bad, they'll learn not to do it, um, yeah. you know, and kind of mostly focus on that and be strict and be quite formal with your kids. The other side is like just praise them, encourage them uh, when they do good things, when they do bad things, just kind of brush it off and like, I don't know, ignore it or something. Mm. And so there are these two and there's there's more than just two ways of thinking about it. Right. But what I need to do is I need to read both. I need to read a book, for example, one each, one from each perspective. And then I come to my conclusions of what I think is best, right? Based on everything, you know, based on my experience growing up, based on my uh, other knowledge from other fields, based on what I saw my parents do, what I saw other parents do, what Islam teaches us, all of these things together. But I like to read one book from each side of the argument, if possible, and then that and then come to conclusions myself right and what that is though bro is that's a lot of reading isn't it so that's why i'm like trying to get started now i suppose because i only need this kind of knowledge in terms of like how to discipline your kids how to speak to them like you really start needing that maybe one year old two years old upwards so i need to you know start early i feel because just yeah. how marketing knowledge took me years to really feel i know what i'm doing uh same with this so yeah and a lot your time is going to be taken up a lot the moment they start crawling and walking bro. oh so yeah he's still <laughs> that's what i'm thinking bro place and that's fine <laughs> that's what i'm thinking man like honestly i can understand when i met a friend recently he's got three kids and i was like yeah my son's only a few months old he's like oh yeah that's the easy time you know and i i, I see exactly i can really understand that that this is way easier than it's gonna be um yeah. so i need to kind of take advantage of that and um and uh you know i I just I, what i don't like though is the negative talk around having kids you know oh it's so difficult yeah. oh this and that it's like i'm i'm not gonna say it's hard i'm gonna say it's a it's challenging and you know even i i don't know i have to ask her but i think my wife would say the same like it's challenging like i don't know it's, it's just different in my mind the difference between challenging and hard hard feels more like oh it's not even worth it kind of thing like oh why am i doing it um but yeah i think if your world view is that we're not here per se for enjoyment we're not here per se for individual living like where we just live individual lives where we follow our our wants and our needs and our desires it's not about that and that will actually lead you down the wrong path anyway in terms of your own happiness anyway so the truth is right now you might not see the the benefits if you like of having kids and all this and lacking sleep but i don't know it kind of gives you it, it kind of completes you in a way i don't know how to say it. it's like it's an element of your life that everyone should have if possible that's what i'm trying to say you know uh, everyone ideally they should they ha should have good family relationships they should have good friends that influence them in a good way they should have some kind of craft they should have a uh, time they spend outside like i just feel like there's certain things in life everyone should have to be complete and one of them is definitely having kids you know yeah for real bro for real well, like um it's a blessing not many people are as as, as far as like what world figures show on western population side it's not something that is immediately in the plans of very many people these days mm. um, you know what they so. say 2.2 .2 kids <laughs> yeah <laughs> they always show him like half a child on the graphs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but by the way did you uh, when did you have your son like after getting married how long was the gap not long bro not long yeah like uh, one year maybe something yeah not long um, bro so i was gonna say yeah like why did you want to have kids then like that i was kind of asking like did you have pref pressure from your parents or your no not at all. parents in law <laughs> yeah the opposite. Oh, opposite i think everyone okay. was like oh my god you've had a child so soon right um i think uh I don't know about my wife, but for me, it was just like, well, it goes back to why I got married in the first place, right? It was to start a family. So after mm. about six or seven months of being married, which mm. some people would argue is way too early, mm. I remember just turning to my wife and just saying, okay, now what? Kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because, <laughs> I will lie. I remember I was driving back from London 
And I just turned to her, I was like, okay, now what? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, I think, you know, yeah, you know it is what it is, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> but I think she was quite like minded in the sense that that is the sort of, we, we, were, we were both of the same sort of, uh, what's the word, disposition mm. when it comes to stuff like this. So naturally, that's just what happened. Um, but yeah, obviously, you know, I'm sure as many people do have, like, oh, yeah, we could have done X, Y, Z, could have traveled more, could have done this more, could have done that more. But I don't really like to think like that. This is, mm. this is, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for us, and this is the decision I made, sort of thing. Mm. And I'm very happy with the way things are. Alhamdulillah. You know how I see it, bro? If you have kids earlier, it means they'll be older when you're like 40, 45. And exactly. I don't know about you, bro, but I actually can see my 40s being the best decade of my life, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. You, you're going to have kids, you're going to have, uh, your kids are a bit older, which means you could like actually do stuff with them rather than just, you know, taking them to the bathroom and cleaning them, yeah? <laughs> so you could yeah. do stuff with your kids, inshallah, you know, you have a few kids, multiple kids. Um, inshallah, financially, you'll be better off with them when you're younger, more knowledge, more wisdom. Um, more good friends and I just feel like and that's a time when now you you've built up inshallah like the the finances the skills the knowledge and stuff now it's like you could go and do your kind of dower thing or your you know your positive influence on the world kind of thing um, just like the the Prophet you know he was 40 when he got wahi and stuff um, and like Allah said I think it was about Yusuf Yusuf and I said um when Yusuf uh, reached maturity and he reached 40 years of age. So I, I know the ulama, like they talk about this age 40 of it being like that, uh, the age of maturity. And you know, this, this globalized culture worships youth, but um, I think it's a bit of a lie. I think when I'm 45, bro, I'm be, I'll be living life, inshallah. What does that mean? <laughs> it just means, it just means, bro, that all this conversation is is making me, <laughs> is making me re sort of reinvigorate me to 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 be a better parent. You know, I mm. think that's it. You get like peaks and troughs with it. You know, and you get complacent sometimes. Um, but now mm. it's good to sort of refresh and talk about it again mm. to uh, to reinvigorate you. Yeah. Mm. Maybe uh, if the listeners can direct us to covering specific topics in this topic, um, that'd be good. Because I, I'm guessing a lot of the listeners, they're, they're maybe they're young adults, they don't have kids yet maybe, and they're just thinking yeah. about it. They're thinking maybe they kind of drank the, is, is this the right term? They drank the Kool-Aid, yeah? They drank yeah. the Kool-Aid of delaying kids or um, not having many kids or whatever. So... Uh, maybe we can kind of go into some of these uh, detailed uh, topics uh, in the next episode. So depending if we get your feedback, uh, we could do that, inshallah. inshallah. And inshallah. the way you would do that is go to mindheistpodcast.com. There you could find our email address or the anonymous questions thing, uh, Curious Cat, Instagram, all different ways of contacting us, inshallah. Inshallah, please do. And um, make dua for... Make to offer our children. No. <laughs> Inshallah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I mean, it's been a pleasure again. Zakallah, yeah. Same um, here. I, I'm, I always just managed to record. Uh, mm -hmm. Keeping it keeping it quite consistent lately, aren't we? Alhamdulillah, very good, yes. I, I think, bro, it's your job. Your job's really contributing. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know, bro. It's just a feeling. It's indirectly <laughs> contributing. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh lad, have the love. I'm glad I'm glad so um I'm glad everyone I hope everyone's enjoying the consistency because people always say, Oh, when's the next episode Mind Heist drop in? Well now you get it every week to the point that I, even I run out of time to, to sort of collect my thoughts in a week. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough happens I suppose. <laughs> but have the love. Um let's just hope we don't run dry. Mm. Not uh, not now that I've opened this can of worms. No, of course. This is a whole new world of discussion now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I need to change the bio because I think it said uh, two... What was it? <laughs> what did I husbands. Write, I two husbands. Most, most sensitive. <laughs> yeah. I think sensible. I'm going to change it to fathers because uh, 
Himself. Even the way you re- even reading that just sounds wrong sometimes. You've got to, you've got to yeah. read it in a certain way. <laughs> yeah. but alhamdulillah. Okay then, inshallah, uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Inshallah. And close off, inshallah. inshallah. Inshallah, yalla. Um, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an ala anta astaghfiruka to be like. Assalamu alaikum, mind high list, mind highest listeners. This has been episode fifty-three. Thanks for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.